So, yes, I have experienced it. And yes, it was entirely horrible. And for like a day or so, I just didn't go on Twitter at all because it was just hideous. But I, I don't know how people, for example, politicians, Diane Abbott, for example, receives the most horrendous stuff on Twitter. I don't know how she can even go on there. That was the answer to my question whether Julia had received any abuse on social media, especially Twitter. And of course she has, because she's in the limelight, is active, may share her opinions, and that means she's open to receiving some nasty comments, which obviously she had done. A really super interesting interview with Julia, where she shares a lot of information, tips and ideas, whether you're just starting up as a business and want to embrace social media, or even if you're an ongoing social media expert, you will learn some really great ideas from Dr. Julia. So enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Julia. How are you today? Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm good, thank you, because, well, I was about to say the sun's out, but actually that would be a lie because it's actually just changed. <laughs> and it's raining again. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so we're we're both in the UK. You're in the South. I'm in the Midlands. Yes. And we've had our fair share of rain. And we love talking about the rain, don't we? And the weather in this oh, yes, country. the weather. Yeah. <laughs> It's just it's just standard fare, isn't it? Oh, I, <laughs> I, I saw a TED talk by somebody who was talking about storytelling, which is my favorite topic. And she she was actually in Nigeria, I think, or somewhere in somewhere in, in Africa. Mm. And she said, We don't have to talk about the weather because <laughs> <laughs> we know what it's going to be like every day. Yes. It's gonna be nice. Well, we've got the opposite at the moment, haven't we? So Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so um yeah, if you if you're in the UK, you know what we're talking about. If you're outside, I hope you've got better weather than we have. <laughs> yeah, we've got monsoon season at the moment. Yeah. Well, you're in Devon and Devon yes. is a beautiful part of the world. So I'm, I'm very, very envious, very jealous, because <laughs> we, we do sometimes go to the south there. It's a long journey, but yeah. it's always worth it. Um, it's just gorgeous uh, in that part of the, of the UK. So you're very lucky to be there. I know, I know. But we did make a deliberate move, actually. Sort of, what was it? 11, 12 years ago. Okay, so, hold, yeah. hold that thought. Hold, hold that thought. I will, I will. Because <laughs> I will now ask you the question, to tell us how you got there. So we'd like for you to tell the listeners a little bit about your personal life. Um, so where were you born? A bit about your education, where you now live, have you moved around? Tell us as much as you would like to, um, and we'd love to get a bit of insight into Julia. Okay. Thank you. I could be here until the middle of next week asking me a question like that, but um, I'll keep it concise. Okay. So I was born. I was born up north, actually, uh, Rothbury in Northumberland. Wow. Um, yeah, which again is another beautiful part of the world, but I don't get up there to see it because it's so far away from Devon. But one day mm. I will get back to see it. Um, and I was one of three kiddos and I myself am now a mum of six children oh, which is whoa. kind of crazy um chaos and crazy but I tell you what you learn so much from children and I'm sure that's part of where my love for words and marketing and persuasion and stuff has sort of grown and incubated through through being with them um where did I get educated I went to Haberdashers Asks School for Girls no less um in Elstree, which was a girls' school, which I loved until I got to the sixth form and then I realised how rigid and, and stuff it actually was. Mm. I was lucky enough to go to uni at Cambridge, which was just brilliant. I've got – my eldest daughter has now finished uni and my next two are at uni at the moment and I'm just so jealous because oh. uni was just amazing wow. for me. So, yeah, that was great. I then went on to do a PhD, which wasn't entirely planned. It was kind of because I – 
couldn't really find anything else to do at the time. Yes. So I went off and I did a PhD <coughs> at Imperial College, but it was split between Imperial College in London and a research place in Norwich. So I spent a year in London, which was fab doing that, and then moved because you asked a question about had I moved around as well, and then mm. moved to Norwich for the next couple of years, um, doing work there and writing up. And then I moved to Derby um, yep. to be with a guy that I'd met while I was writing up, and we ended up getting married, but that didn't last for very long. But anyway, I lived with him in Derby. Yep. And then I was lucky enough to get a job at the Metropolitan Police Forensic Science Lab wow. who wanted – they were putting together a research and development team – and they wanted people who had been working on what was a very new DNA technique then that I'd actually been using in my PhD. And I'd done a three or four months. I tidied up the end of a three or four month project for someone at Warwick Uni um, at the same time as I'd been writing up. And those skills I picked up then actually fitted exactly what they wanted there, which was a stroke of luck because those jobs just, well, I think that's the only time they've actually come up with jobs like that. So I moved down to to close to London, actually just down the road from my parents for a while. And I started my career in forensic science, which I stayed in for about 15 years. And it was fabulous. So I started off doing R&D, but then ended up in a position where I was leading one of the two teams in Britain that brought in this new form of DNA profiling that formed the basis of the National DNA Database. Right. So we had to, we took the methodology and we tested it to make sure that it would actually give robust results every single time because, of course, you've got to be able to rely on something when you're using it in forensic science. But then another side to that role was that I was working in the London lab. And of course, the people who went to court in the London lab went to court in the highest courts in the land. So they went to high court, they went to appeals court. So they wanted to know that this system worked and that they could actually defend it confidently in court. Part of my role suddenly became um, putting together the training for these reporting officers and delivering it. And I'd never really done anything like that at all before. So it was definitely sort of being thrown right into it. But it was brilliant. And I loved it. And I think I realized then that I really enjoyed taking technical stuff and turning it into a form that people who didn't know so much about it but needed to know could understand and actually then go away and, and confidently deliver on their own. So that was fantastic. And my role then morphed into one where I was leading a team of 60 scientists who were processing the samples at one of the labs that then fed the National DNA Database, and that was in Huntingdon. So I travelled from where we lived up and down to Huntingdon. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that was that was a very interesting time. So taking people from agency where they didn't really know very much about anything in terms of forensic science to be able to actually process these samples on time and to the quality we needed. So a lot of troubleshooting there, a lot of dealing with what the police wanted and also dealing with what the home office were expecting. But sadly, lots of things then happened at once. So the forensic science service was then an agency of the Home Office, but it actually went its own way and became its own business, if you like. Yes. But they weren't really business-minded. Right. So there was a lot of competition that was then allowed to spring up through new legislation in terms of lots of smaller labs that were doing processing of samples for the police. Mm -hmm. Plus, I by that stage, I then had three children and I was finding it very difficult to actually work and manage childcare. So I ended up in a role where I was just working one day a week from home. But at the same time, the forensic science service was was crumbling, if you like, and it ended oh. up going through restructuring. Eventually it closed, but I got out at the stage where it was restructuring. So that was that really, which was which was sad because it was a career that I had absolutely loved, but it didn't work that easily with mm. being with lots of children either. Mm. So we moved down to Devon when I had five children under the age of, well, the oldest was 10. The youngest was a baby. Oh. Husband was working away a lot of the time because he oh. still worked in the forensic science service. That's where I met him. Yeah. Um, and moved to a role in the home office. So he was working away a lot. 
So I had a couple of years of just being mum, which, well, it wasn't just at all. I was absolutely exhausted, but it was, it was great. It yeah. was lovely. And baby number six came along. But about three months into that, I decided I couldn't just be a mum anymore. Mm. Um, so I actually looked out for business opportunities. And the first thing I landed on, which I don't talk about very much, was I jumped on an opportunity to actually sell uh, children's wear, knitted jumpers and things. Right. Uh, it was just, it was a totally commission based thing. So you bought in your, if you like your samples and then you made sales and you got commission on all the things you made sales on. Honestly, I'd never done anything like this in my life before. And they were quite, it was really good learning, which is why I'm mentioning it because they were quite expensive yes. jumpers and stuff. And I ended up doing a lot of shows because I realized that was the way to get in front of a lot of people all at the same time. It was sort of before social media had really become mainstream and I hadn't yeah. really looked at social yet but it meant that I was turning up in front of people um, expecting them to shell out like 30 40 quid for a kid's jumper when they'd had no prior knowledge no warming up at all so of course it was a fairly unmitigated disaster I mean I, I met I made enough to cover my expenses but that was about it oh um, so I was then looking for something that I could do around the children. And I was looking at running a franchise because I wanted a business opportunity that I could sort of plug and play. So I ended up being on lots of lists for franchises and business opportunities. Mm. But at the same time, my eldest daughter, who was then 13, and my youngest was one at that stage, she was really wanting to go on Facebook. And right. as you can imagine, being a mum of kids all that age, I hadn't really had time to breathe, leave alone look at social media. Yes. So all of a sudden, I started looking at it. And at the same time, I was getting lots of emails through talking about marketing for small businesses and all that kind of thing. And the two just kind of collided out there in, in the world for me. So I looked at Facebook. Yes, yeah, she was allowed on there. And that was all fine. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I realized that it was a massive opportunity for small businesses. And I'd always been interested in marketing. I'd always been interested in words and communication. So I went off and did a bit of training and started learning more about it and ended up launching a business, helping small businesses with it. Wow. I mean, just from your daughter asking to go onto Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> That's mad, isn't it? It's totally mad. I know. I told someone else the story and they said, you know, do you always end up doing things in such depth when your your kids ask you a question? And I thought, well, no, not always. And it's probably a good job, isn't it, really? <laughs> it is really, yeah. Um, and do you remember what year that was, roughly? When I started the business, or was 2010, I started getting really, like, interested yes. in just the training and stuff, but it was 2011 before I had my first paying client. Right. Yeah. And how did you, because <clears throat> it's probably around the same time that I got into it, mm. too, and I'm, I'm interested, how did you, because at that time, there weren't many people teaching it, right? No. So how did you get? Because it's quite difficult to start from nothing. Did yeah. you learn anything from people? And, and where were those people based that you learned from? Yeah, they were largely in the States. Yes. I would say there was a lot of training available mm. in the States. So the guy that brought it to my attention was actually Nigel Bottrell. I don't know if you. Yes, I do. Okay. So yes. he's a big, well, certainly was then. I mean, still got a big organization going, a big UK entrepreneur. Yes. So he launched um, training because he could see it was an opportunity. So I did his and then used that as a launch pad and then followed Mari Smith. Yes. Who was out there at the time. Yes. There was a lady called Jo Barnes who nope. was doing quite a lot of online training. And there was another lady whose name I can't remember who was also based in the States. And Social Media Examiner was starting off just yes. around that time as yes. well, I think. So I yes. hooked into their stuff. Yeah. And also um, Anne Handley and the content marketing and, and marketing professionals that mm. the website that was out there, I started following her as well. So yeah, a few people yes. were out there talking about it. Mari and, and Smith. People. Yeah. Yes. I remember Mari because she's Scottish Canadian, isn't she? Yes. And I remember her Facebook stuff was yeah. unbelievable. She had yeah. nailed it. 
yeah. so much. And I really respected what she was doing. Um, yes. I, I, I was, so it must have been around the same time. I think it probably was 2009 um, that I got really heavily involved in it and Facebook and, and everything else. So I was, was quite early on, but again, yes. it, I mean, we can chat about what I think of it all now, but um, mm -hmm. it's, I, I do believe that, that there were some key people. And in America at the time, I was actually looking to get a, like a university course on social media yeah. and there was nothing around. And I was asking people yeah. in America, I was like, how can I get a course that I can actually get a proper qualification in this? Yeah. And everybody went, don't bother with it. Just learn from the best people that you know type of thing. And I went, oh, okay. And <laughs> that's what I did, you know, and that's yeah. how I got my knowledge. And it sounds like you did exactly the same and, and some other yeah. people that I hadn't heard of. Um, because I, there were some LinkedIn guys that I learned from at the time. And, um, and then I realized that actually they didn't know as much as I thought they did. I mean, yeah. It was, yeah, really, really fascinating. Oh, great. So, so you've been doing this bit then for, for like 10 years, nearly? Yeah, nearly pretty years. close to that. Yes, yeah. it will be crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And that's, that's pretty much, you've seen pretty much all of the changes happening, good and bad changes then over that period of time and the new ones coming in and going and, and yes. how it's all developing. So, so you had six, you had six children working from home. Yeah. Then discovering social media with the starter being Facebook. Yeah. How did you then decide? I can make a business out of this. Was it all through Nigel Bottrell or through your own stuff? How, how did that come about? The first part was because he, he offered this training and he, on a, a sideline to that was sort of offering you a website and stuff. So I, I took that offer up. That was great. Mm. Um, but looking back, I can't believe that it was naive enough to think that, well, with a bit of social media training and a website, I knew enough to be able to go out there and launch a business. It was hilarious. But, you know, you pick up stuff as you go, don't you? Mm. But I see a lot of people now, when they start in business, they, they are taking skills or something that they've already got from, say, corporate life and putting it into a business. And that's hard enough. But here I was, like, piecing together social, sort of working out how a business ran and, and trying to help other people who – were like even further behind the the social than I was. So yeah, it was yeah. quite it was quite a thing. But there were luckily I met some other people who were interested in doing a similar sort of thing. So we helped each other along with resources. There were people there who knew about business because they were already running, say, web agencies or yes. um, graphic design agencies, things right. like that. So right. so they were a great help, I have to say, in those first few months um and i did pick up some clients through nigel's organization and i ended up actually with nigel as a client as well which was great so that really helped my business if you like find its feet mm -hmm. because then other people within his entrepreneur organization were interested in working with the person that he was working with i mean it's a it's a double-edged sword because it's lovely because it, it brought me in people who were interested, but also it made me think that, oh, and this is very early days, of course, I was very naive. Oh, like this business thing is really easy. I can just, you know, pick up a client and then all these other clients come to me and I don't have to worry too much about going there, out there and marketing, mm. which wasn't the best way actually to start off. In a way, I'd have been better off had I had to go out there and really work hard to get to get clients, which I didn't in the first few years. So yeah, that was interesting. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And it because it's that I, I I'll, I'll just share with you a little story about where I was at. So I, I decided I wanted to become, I won't give you the whole backstory, but I then had decided I wanted to help people with their social media because I knew something, you know, yeah. And I knew how they could leverage it. 
And then I was going to networking events and people said, oh, what do you do? And I said, oh, well, I'm on social media trading. And, went, and people were going, oh, not another one, mm. right, like that. And I went, oh, blast, you know, people aren't receiving this very well. What do I do? Yeah. So I then decided, because I was like a generalist, I was doing Facebook, Twitter, Instagram was only just not even, her, you know, mm. was, was yeah. just the kind of thought process for most people. Uh, I, I mean, I had adopted Instagram really early on because it was just like a photo filter that you had on your phone, yeah. you know. Yeah. It wasn't a social media platform as such because Facebook hadn't bought it yet then. Yeah. And then um, I went, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to master on LinkedIn. So I then made LinkedIn kind of my, you know, my unique selling right. point on yeah. social media. I could still help people with Facebook and Twitter and all of the other things and the publishing platforms and Hootsuite and Buffer yeah. and everything else. But it was kind of LinkedIn that was going to be my expertise. And only because of the reaction that people gave it. Well, yeah, had I stuck with it, I probably would have been running a big social media agency by now, you know, <laughs> had I known that how big it was going to be. I was just put off by the reaction I was getting from people. And um, so... It's it's interesting because a lot of people believe, well, you give me your view on this. Lots of people mm. believe they know what to do with social media. What's your yeah. view on that? <laughs> Absolutely. In the in the early days, it was, if you like, easy to find people who needed help because there weren't very many people out there actually helping with social mm. media. Um, and lots of people didn't even really know how to set up, for example, a Facebook page or a, a page on LinkedIn for their company or whatever. Whereas now, yes, a lot of people believe that they know how to use social media because they know which buttons to press yes. or because they've got somebody in their organization who's in their early 20s and they spend all their time on social. So, yeah, there are a lot of people who are using social media, which is great, but mm. I would say very few out of those are actually getting what they want from mm. social Mm. And what do you think people want from it? The small business owners that I talk to, they want more customers. Yeah, yeah. End of the day. Mm. And a, a reliable stream of customers if they possibly can. They want to be able to predict, well, don't we all, um, the number of clients coming through the door and, and what their income is going to be. I'm sure that's what they would absolutely love. Mm. It's, it's that I, I love how you've, phrase that because that's the outcome isn't it absolutely it's a marketing kind of tool in your toolkit of other marketing tools yeah and what at the end of the day do you want to achieve with it because i don't think people are very clear no how when no, they get I would started say, yeah that's that's the first problem mm. with so many i I think so many businesses are using social because you have to use social because everyone's on social, but they haven't really clarified what it is that, that they want to get from it. No. And because it's so big now as well. Yes. What do you think about the saturation of it all? Well, there definitely is overwhelm. We've got content shock, to use Mark Schaefer's phrase, mm. everywhere we go, whatever online medium you look at, there is too much to take on board. There is massive overwhelm. And I think that's the other problem with small for small businesses that we see over and over again is that they are they're just adding to that. So if they're trying to use social for their businesses and they're putting stuff out there, they tend just to be adding to the noise rather than actually standing out because it takes a bit more effort very often, takes a little bit more effort, a little bit more planning to actually stand out from the crowd to the people that they want to attract to them. Mm. Mm. But yeah, it's a very big, a very noisy place. And from the audience's perspective, there's too much to take on board. From the business's perspective, there are too many platforms to try and use. So whichever way you look at it, you're you're faced with potential overwhelm. 
So when, I mean, presumably that's one of the focus areas that you help people with when they are in overwhelm and there are so many platforms to master as well that you do get to a certain point that you go, oh, which, wh where should I be doing it? So where I was at, just to explain to you a little bit about, this is not about me because I want to hear your stuff, but yeah. um, where I got to, I was use, I was, I was ridiculous where I was. I was posting through Buffer because I love Buffer. Mm. Um, well, I should say I, I used to love Buffer because I don't use them anymore, but I, I got to know the company really well. I was even paying yeah. for the product because I wanted to post so much across all of my channels. It was like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, particularly under there. It was like all yeah. of them, this the same content, slightly tweaked. I was getting, you know, content feeds so I could keep posting content about the stuff that I followed and wanted to give loads of value to people. Like, you know, three times a day I was posting um, coffee, lunch and dinner time, you know. Mm. Uh, it was like all of the kind of training that I – you've got to be posting and posting and posting to stand out from the crowd, yeah. give them value there. And I just, I just stopped. I went, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, and I kind of went, just stop. This is just getting, and at the same time, a few years ago, I started listening. I saw somebody recommended a, a Netflix documentary called Minimalism. And right. um, two guys there called The Minimalists, and I started listening to their podcast. And I then realized that actually I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a minimalist. But then I started realizing what I was doing with social media, and I went, right, just scale it back completely mm. and only share things that you think are valuable for people to take notice of or, yep. you know, rather than just kind of, use the kind of fire hose mentality and just spray and pray type of thing. Yes. Absolutely. Sorry, just giving you a bit of insight of where I've been with social media. No, I, abso I absolutely love that because I still think there are so many people that are, because it's there, mm. then they're going to shove stuff out regardless. Yes. Just because they want to be uh, top of mind. That's the phrase that used to be used by so many yes. social media gurus. Keep top of mind, you know, as you say, keep posting stuff out so that people remember you. And it's just, I actually can't cope if I hear that kind of advice anymore, because I think, well, hello, if we do that as businesses and as people, then we are contributing to this massive wall of noise, which I think for some people is actually really, really unhelpful. And I think it goes beyond unhelpful, actually, mm. this idea of overwhelm and trying to keep up. And I think we're actually contributing to a, a big problem if we go out there and just post masses of times because we can and we're not actually sharing, as you said, something that we really think is going to help people. Yeah, yeah. And, and the question that then comes up is this whole – um discourse if that's the right term mm. where people use it as a megaphone to attack and you know well there's complain attack yeah and you know the nastiness that's that's coming through especially on twitter yeah the language that people are using because they can it's like you said they can use it there yes if you were sitting opposite somebody face to face, you wouldn't be using those words, but because you can write it and just blast it out there. Absolutely. Um, and actually also most of the most popular kind of uh, content is when there is abuse. People are yes. attracted to it as well. Yeah, which I don't actually personally understand. No. I have to say, I love I love social media for the fact that you can have some discussions. I love social media for the fact that you 
like you can learn about other people and where they come from and what their opinions are and what their context is and and their lives. And I really love that side of it. And honestly, my eyes have been open hugely from having been on social. Mm. But as you say, that other side where you just get people who are on lockdown and anything that appears to be different from something that they've experienced, different from their norm, then they just attack it. I, just, I find it very difficult to stomach. Mm. Uh, but I think if we see that and if we're aware of it and if we want to do something about it, then in a way, our best bet is maybe to try and point out to people, if it's possible, the fact that they don't have to go out and attack people like that. Or if we can say something to try and ameliorate the situation or whatever we can do, however tiny it is, then you know I do believe that we can try and make a difference. Mm, yeah. Have you been on the receiving end of anything like that? Because you're you're quite active on so many platforms and you you ask really, really good questions on there as well of people to get that engagement. But have you had any nastiness thrown at you at all? No, thank you for that. I haven't so much through what I've posted about social, but I do dive in sometimes and talk about stuff that's going on in the media or whatever else. Mm. And um, oh, I have on social, actually, about five or six years ago, I had a whole bunch of people mm. jumping on uh, who were giving me a really hard time because at that time um, I was using Twitter automation. Oh, my God. You, like, you have to play with these things, don't you, to realize yes. that you don't like them. So I played with it for a couple of months. And, yes, it was hideous, but they realized that I was doing this. So they decided all to, like – have a real go at me, which was really horrible. Mm. Um, but it was something I was doing, and fair enough. They just didn't have to say it so horribly. But much more recently, I actually shared a very unpopular opinion, which was why did – there was a, a big case going on about um, a youngish lad who'd attacked a very, very young girl, and mm. she died. And they had kept the name – um, secret confidential but then the judge was actually going to release the name mm. out to the world and I tweeted out I don't understand mm. why this name is being going to be released I don't understand how it's going to help anybody mm. and in fact it's just going to make matters far worse and I got hate tweets for about a fortnight after that from people who were so enraged that I could seemingly be on the side of this person who'd mm. done this heinous thing so yes i have experienced it and yes it was entirely horrible and for like a day or so i just didn't go on twitter at all because it was just hideous but i i don't know how people for example politicians diane abbott for example receives the most horrendous mm. stuff on twitter i don't know how she can even go on there mm. it's unbelievable yeah yeah and and you recovered from it, though. You decided to go I back did. again. I did because, like, and, and I would say the same thing again because I think maybe it got somebody just somewhere to think differently, maybe, or reconsider their opinion. Obviously, lots and lots of people weren't going to reconsider anything from the stuff I got back, but maybe there were a couple of people who didn't say anything who maybe thought differently. And there were two or three people who actually responded and supported what I said, yes, which was nice. Um, but yes, I went back because I think sometimes just asking questions can start to pave the way for something new. I, I, I think you're absolutely right that because everybody has a voice now through social media, everybody can, you know, freedom of speech kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I listened to a podcast by, I don't know if you've come across this lady, Cara Swisher in Silicon Valley. Um, no, I haven't. Oh, you would love this. It's called, oh. well, she does two podcasts. One's called Recode Decode. Uh, it's, it's the Vox Media Network in America. I've been listening to her now for a few years. Yeah. And she's been like in Silicon Valley from the very beginning. Right. And um, you know, days of AOL and all of that. Yeah. And um, she does another podcast called Pivot, which she does with Professor Scott Galloway. Um, that's quite a recent one, so that's been out for about a year. 
and I listened to both of them and their discussion, their debate is very, very good. They kind of fire, they, they talk about winners and losers in the press, you know, talking from kind of companies in America, talking about the politics, talking about Facebook in particular. Right. And so it's fascinating. And Rico Deco, she has some really interesting guests on. She has a downer on Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and mm. maybe that's why I have a downer on, on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. Um, I'm not on Instagram and WhatsApp. I came off both platforms. Facebook, right. I'm having to be there for different reasons, but I'm no longer active as such. I closed my, my official Staying Alive Facebook page down. I mean, it's really ridiculous because it could be harming my business, right? Or mm. what I've done could be harming my business. But I kind of, I don't know, I took a kind of stand because Zuckerberg I just think he lies about the stuff that goes on on Facebook. But we won't go into that. We won't go into that <sighs> for another discussion for another day. Yes, but, maybe. Um, the point that so, so she she's really useful to listen to because she's like at the sharp end about all of right. the stuff that's going on with social media and her, talks about her kids that are on social and this, that and the other. So so it's it's really interesting. I've forgotten the point I was going to make now or ask. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me think. Um, so why did I talk about her and Facebook? No, it's gone. It's gone. It will come back. It will come back to me. It will. Okay. It will. So if if you were sitting down with a business today who, let's say, because this podcast will appeal to all businesses, I hope, business people, but I'm particularly targeting people that are sitting on the fence, want to start a business and don't know how to start, maybe in the same situation where you are, they have their children, they're having to be, you know, look after them and, but still want to do something at home. Yeah. And, um, but so now they're kind of going, okay, I'm starting my business. I've got to go onto social. What would, what advice would you give them? What if you got, you know, like a startup? And they need to consider to get onto social. What, okay, what initial well, advice would you give them? The standard advice is, oh, go on the social media platform where your audience is hanging out, right? Mm, yes. Um, I would say a lot of times today you will find that the same person will be using, say, three social media platforms. So I say we don't have to think about that as much as we used to they used to be much more exclusive i would say audiences whereas now they're much more mixed up mm. but i would say think about the type of content that is going to be easiest for you to create because the content creation if you're going to go on to social is the thing that's going to take up the most time potentially but also the most of your mental energy so you don't want to be working against yourself or against other factors in your business when you are creating your content you want to make it as easy as possible and as impactful as possible so think about whether you prefer writing stuff whether you've got great images whether you feel good about creating like short little videos or whatever and then try and fit that to a social media platform that you feel comfortable and at ease using so I would tend to much more be guided by actually yourself and the resources you've got available to choose your social media platform and just start with one in the beginning than to to try and think well where is my audience and I've actually got to force this content out you know just to suit this platform even though I'm finding it really difficult because I think that way when you're trying to work around children and, and everything as well that way is where overwhelm will lie. I, I think that is just the best brilliant advice I've ever heard. <laughs> That's oh, good. <laughs> that, that is so sensible um, in terms of a starting point. So I yeah. hope people really, really take note of this because 100% I agree with you. Things have moved on and changed so much. And, and I guess it's a case of you don't know what you don't know. So you've got to start somewhere. Absolutely. And just and it might be that, yeah, maybe you're already using Instagram because you love it. You know, mm. maybe just morph that into something that's going to work for your business. Switch to a business account, you know, start using stories a bit more, link to your 
you know, link through to your website or a freebie or whatever, or maybe start a new account for your business, you know, keep your other one going, but start a new account. But because you already know how to work it, you know, focus on that, that might be the way to go. And what I'm glad you said business account versus, you know, another account. Yeah. So I guess we're talking about business versus personal. Yeah. And what what's your view on on that, for example? Because do you think it gets diluted? I mean, if you're a business on your own, you're starting on your yeah. own, or yeah. even you've got, you know, a few employees, but when yeah. you're starting, generally people start on their own. And it's so easy nowadays, you know, there's going to be more and more solopreneurs yes. that are going to get started because they've got all these amazing tools available to them. Yeah. Um, but do you, because it's hard work having to manage a business one and a personal one. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And I think if you're starting on your own, then it's perfectly fine to be talking about business stuff and then talk about more personal stuff as well. And if you are in, especially if you are going to be working with somebody in terms of you're providing a service, then people, of course, want to actually get to know who you are, the person. And your personality is, you know, in those first stages is going to be part of your brand. It can't not be because it will shine through everything that you put out there. You sort of can't help it unless you really switch off, in which case you'll probably find that your content is lacking something anyway. So yeah, perfectly fine to start off with sharing your personal stuff on an account that is designed for your business. You can mix the two up. And in fact, I think, you know, it used to be maybe even as, even maybe only one year ago on Instagram, you'd, you'd have people that were, that were creating business accounts and sharing only business stuff, like only say little quotes or behind mm. the scenes or stuff, whatever with their business. And mm. I actually think they are losing out now because of course, algorithms, things change. The posts that I see that are out there on Instagram getting the most engagement are, even if they come from a business account, they are posts from the business owner sharing something personal about their lives. So I really strongly believe that we need that content mixed in with more business content because otherwise how on earth can people get to know like and trust you yeah but if you are a business that's got a number of staff of course then <clears throat> it's a little more difficult to take that route you might still want to keep your personality as the brand of the business but if you want to dissipate it out a bit but you can still tell your story you can still tell stories that belong to your staff that can still be part of your Instagram content, for example, or anywhere else, to be quite honest. Yeah. I, I, I Again, you're spot on. I, I totally concur with that. And that's how I've always operated it myself. Yeah. As, and I guess it's that I've my handle everywhere is my business name. Yeah. But the name that goes with it is my personal name and the photograph yes. that goes with it is my personal photograph. Yes. So there's like I'm combining the two in one. Yeah. Um, people get to know me as at Staying Alive UK, but it's Michael De Groot. That's like the name that goes with that handle. Absolutely. And yeah. Rather than at Michael De Groot, which I could have done, but I decided very early on to have the same handle across everything. So people got, you know, got some recognition of that. Yeah. So, but I, I, 100% agree with you. I, th I think when people, you know, if you're like a major brand, of course you've got to have a business account. Yeah. And even still, even then, people enjoy seeing the personal touch coming through and yeah. making that connection. And you, so why you lit up on Twitter for me is. I don't know what it was doing or why you be you became visible to me. Yeah. It was the words that you were using with the content or the photo or the video clips that you were posting. And um it was congruent with who you are. So your personality came through um sharing information and tips and ideas and concepts that were just totally congruent with who you are. And I went, oh, I'd, I'd love to get Julia on a podcast <laughs> to have a chat about all of this stuff because 
it really resonated with me. So, so yeah, I, I guess people only need to see you and what you're doing and just copy what you're doing. <laughs> Well, in a way, yes, thank you. That's really nice. And Twitter actually is a case in point with this idea of separating out our business from our personal lives. And I think it's maybe one of those networks where people still feel they've got to have a business account for Twitter mm. and a personal account if they want to use it, because that used to be the advice way back, advice that I never took, I hasten to add. And it sounds like you didn't either. Um, but like, if you're just sharing businessy stuff on Twitter, imagine how dry and boring that could potentially be. We, we do need to see people's personalities shine through. And especially because you've only got your 240 characters to actually attract somebody's attention. So, yeah, please don't shy away from, from being you out there on the socials. Thank you, Julia. How, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I feel like you've given us all like a consultancy session in this podcast. <laughs> um, That's great. So I apologize if I've asked questions that kind of gives away some of your tools, techniques and ideas, but I oh, do, no, appreciate, do appreciate all of your really honest and, and transparent answers. Um, that's really amazing. I don't know where social media is going. I've... Um, I know what I was getting to, actually, one of the questions I haven't asked, which I'm going to ask now, mm. uh, which was, I think, related to me telling you about these other podcasts. But yeah. anyway, um, what is your view jumping on the bandwagon? And then I'll tell you about the experiment I did. Jumping on the bandwagon on topical things that are in the media that are being highly followed and spoken about with a specific hashtag. I mean, for uh -huh. example, we're in the UK, so Brexit is very top of mind at the moment. Exactly, um, yes. <laughs> or the election, you know, the hashtag yeah. on election 2019 or UK election 2019 or election yeah. 19 or whatever. What is your view in going, oh, look at that, it's trending across the board. I'm going to jump on the bandwagon and get my posts out there? Um, when it's just done like that, I hate it. Terrible. You see it out on Twitter. You see people going out there sharing tweets that have got nothing to do with whatever it would, with whatever hashtag it is that they've decided that they're going to pop in there. And they've literally just put that hashtag in their tweet because it's a trending topic and they want their tweet to be seen by more people. However, if it's a subject that you have an opinion about and you want to share it and thinking again about our personal branding, particularly for small businesses, then, you know, there's no reason why you can't go out there and share your opinion and use the same hashtag. And yes, it might put you in front of some new people. And similarly, for example, TV programs, I think is an opportunity that a lot of businesses miss out on where they could actually be going out there and engaging with an audience that could be interested in them based on, for example, a particular TV program that they're watching and using a hashtag. But, you you know, you need to do it with a little bit of discernment and a little bit of discretion because mm. the minute you go out there and just use a hashtag, particularly when it's a div something that could be divisive yes, or when it's to do with, for an example, event, an event that's a tragedy and you're turning around and you're, and you're making the most of it for your business, you are going to lose your audience um, left, right and centre. Some people, some businesses love PR, whether it's positive or negative. And if that's you, then, you know, and if that's a strategy that works for you, then go right ahead. But on the whole, I hate that kind of thing. Mm. But some businesses will use it really, really smartly. So some of the um, national days and international days that come up, for example, their hashtags end up trending. Yes. And I've seen some beautiful examples where businesses have just woven that into their Twitter content. There is a library up in, I think it's in the Orkneys, and they're so smart. They look out for these national international days. And they, I mean, it's a library. Who would have thought of it? Yeah. But they create like 
little tweets, little memes or little videos or whatever that fit absolutely within that national that international day. So they go out there and their content gets seen by a load more people than it ordinarily would. And that is using the bandwagon, if you like, smartly and in a way that people love when they come across it. But there is the opposite of just jumping on it, using it for your business, which is going to get you a lot of backlash. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, I, I concur. So let me tell you about my experiment. Okay. So my experiment, I've never done anything like this before. I, I was listening to the radio and there was um, Radio 5 Live. One of the reporters was interviewing a politician and mentioned that there is a Laurel and Hardy video going viral across Europe making fun of the UK leaving oh. the EU, right? Right. And it's a little comedy clip where they're loading into a car and then they're driving off and they're saying bye, bye, bye to people in the street, like repeatedly. Right. It's actually really funny. Um, and they drive off and they drive over a nail and the tyre goes flat. <laughs> um, so it's like, you know, flat tyre. England gets a flat yeah. tyre. And somebody, I think it must be Spain, because it's a Spanish sounding name, put this video clip on YouTube. But it was a very... So I, I went and searched for it to find it straight away when I heard this. And he recorded it, must have been recorded on his phone. And, right. in the, and later on, I discovered it was actually on Facebook, this clip. And he recorded it from Facebook. So it was like portrait, but yeah. a really poor version of it. Right. And I went, oh, I can do better than that. So... I went and searched for the clip on YouTube. I found it, but I found a slightly better one, which was a bit longer. <sighs> and it showed also that these people were, that Laura and Hardy were loading the car and they were fighting with each other and the people in the <laughs> car and hitting each other and stuff, which I felt emulated more of yes. what's going on in the UK, you know, fighting yes, with perfect. each other in the car before getting into the car together. Yep. <laughs> and so uh, I went, okay. I'm going to just replicate this. Now, I had a strap line on the video that played all the way through saying how England planned to leave the EU, right? Mm. With a little wavy harm uh, emoji on it. And I went, yeah, well, that's incorrect. It's not just England, is it? Mm. Well, I'm a Dutchman. And when I lived in the Netherlands, we didn't think, we couldn't understand what Great Britain meant. We couldn't understand right. what the United Kingdom meant. Yeah, we called it all England. That's yes. the the con on the continent. We just call it England. So I went, yeah. oh, I understand why he's called it England. He's Spanish or Italian or French or whatever. I think he's Spanish or she, and um, that's why he's called it England. Okay, I'm gonna keep it the same, right? I'm gonna, yeah. I'm going to literally copy. Now this is really naughty. I'm copying somebody else's content, hundred <laughs> percent. But the <laughs> clip is slightly longer, right? Julia, it went mad. So I can imagine. <laughs> it went mad. So this this video of his had like 10,000 views. All of a sudden, mine by the next day had 3,000 views. I've never had that many views on my content oh, on no. YouTube. Then this just started increasing and increasing and increasing. I've now, my video has overtaken the other guy's video. Or wow. They, they've got about 26,000. I've nearly got 34,000 views on my video clip. I've gained about <laughs> a, I've gained about two dozen followers on my YouTube right. channel. I've only got about 300 odd. So I've got a, got a couple of dozen more view, um, subscribers. So it's not been like I've had no kind of business inquiries come through or yeah. anything like that. And I went, Oh, there's a lesson in there somewhere. It's discourse because it's, you know, a topic, topical thing. It, Brexit, obviously, leaving yeah. the EU, making fun of it. Uh, but there's a serious undertone. Some of the comments have been awful that are, that yeah. are on there. People, you know, some, some YouTube have literally held back because the swear words in them, there's oh. like... You know, so I haven't released those to go onto the onto the uh, video, 
But there's yeah. been loads of comments, loads of likes, and and some people kind of making fun of it, joining in the humour of it. Yeah. Um, but I've left it on. I just wanted to see what happened. Okay, the, the views have slowed down a tiny bit, but it's still going up every day. You know, it's still wow. increasing. And so that's why I asked the question about does it make a difference, you know, kind of following on to something that is already going viral or whether it's a hashtag or a video like that and and doing something else with it because there's obviously something in it, but I agree with you. Your advice is, is more elegant, is more authentic, is congruent with who you are and and what you should be doing and coming across in a way that is... And and I actually gave full credit to this other video. I, I, I was honest, you know, I have copied yeah. this video. And in fact, that person had copied somebody else's video oh, right. <laughs> um, from Facebook. So there's a lot of copying going on. And I mean, yeah. the only thing is YouTube picks it up because there's a music track on there, which is obviously some music in the Laurel and Hardy. And, right, and, yeah. and immediately they pick it up and saying, okay, you can't have any advertising. Any advertising goes to this other company type of thing. Yeah. And recognizing the music is on that. Well, I can't advertise anymore anyway because I haven't got a thousand followers. Yeah. You have to have a thousand followers, which I did ha have the opportunity. I earned some money from my channel, but they changed this a few years ago, which was very unfair. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that story with you and the listeners to, and, and kind of debate the topic about. Do you jump on the bandwagon or don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's that's an amazing story, but interesting that it hasn't necessarily brought any business inquiries no. yet, of course. But of course, that's for the people that have seen that video. That's potentially the first time that they've come across you. So they maybe need to get to know, like and trust you a little bit if they yeah. are the right people for your business anyway mm. that are watching that video. So, yeah, that's it'll be interesting to hear back from you again in maybe a month or two months as to whether that really did turn into yes. to anything or not. But I, th I think for a lot of businesses, if they want to jump on something like that, it is worth trying to find something that fits within their scope if they really want to make sure that you know, putting in that time and effort to do something like that is actually going to pay them back. That's or create create your own. I hate using the word viral. Create your own catchy or attention grabbing video by just being out there and doing something that is maybe a little bit different, or get inspiration from somebody else, but bring it back to something that's maybe slightly more relevant to your business. A great advice, and and actually, it is congruent with my business. Yeah, because I create um, whiteboard animations and I do this thing called weekly cartoon. We're not doing it every week, but if there's something topical in politics, right, we do this weekly cartoon. Or if there's a news item that that grabs my attention, I do this little cartoon and make a bit oh, of nice. fun of it. And we, d so I have these closed shaves. Another one I did about eighteen months ago. Somebody told me about, and this was just as we were starting the weekly cartoon. Uh, somebody told me about the story about the flat earth guy called Mike Hughes, Mad Mike Hughes in mm. America, who was building a rocket to fly into the orbit to prove that the earth is flat, oh, yeah. right? And so wonderful story. So I did this little cartoon and little did I know, about three months later, I get contacted by a documentary maker in America who's making a documentary about my, my cues and wow. wants to use my animation, literally 30-second clip, Fabulous. at the end of his documentary and in the credits. So it came out this year on Amazon Prime. It's called Rocket Man, if anybody wants to go and watch it. Oh. And it's it's a really good documentary, and I really warm to the guy that that's the, the flat earth guy. I really yeah. warm to what he's doing because he it's not just about the fact that, okay, He's got it wrong, maybe. Uh, yeah. um, it's his dedication to it is so incredible. Yeah. You know, he believes in something and he's put all of his life into it. It's just an wow. incredibly heartwarming story. And right at the end is my clip, but I thought it was going to be like playing a little bit of it through the titles. Mm. 
they put the whole clip right at the end. Oh, wow. Um, in full view, you know, full screen. Yeah. And I went, yeah. wow. So Gosh. I are, he, he even did a, he has a trailer on it. And I asked him, I said, oh, I really would like to get it at the end of the trailer because then people don't have to watch the whole movie. And he went, I'll do it for you. So he then, wow. but it's another close shave because I haven't had any business from it. Yeah. He's given me full credit as well in the, in the video, mm. in the documentary. I haven't had any business from it. I said to him when he asked me for it, I said, because he was going to all the festivals with it and everything. Yeah. I said, okay, well, if it's going to go on Netflix, you're going to give me something, aren't you? He went, yeah, if it goes on Netflix, you will definitely do. It's gone on Prime now. So should I be asking for some money for it now? <laughs> you know? Well, I would if I was in your shoes, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe I will. So I've yeah. had a couple of clothes. So it's again, it's something topical in the news. Yes. If you can make it your own. Yes. Um, I wouldn't recommend the copy thing that I did, but it was an experiment. But I agree yeah. with you. If it's congruent with who you are in your business and it's part of what you're doing anyway, then it makes sense to adopt it. Yeah. I mean, look at people like innocent for example you know i'm the biggest fan of their social media i absolutely love it so i mean they'll talk about the clocks going back and they'll talk about the weather and all those peculiarly british things that we love to talk about but they do it in such a way that it just makes you chuckle or it mm. makes you laugh um and then if there is something in the news that's quite funny then very often they will jump on top of that mm. as well and and they just end up with posts that get shared a gazillion times because of that. So they're just putting their own version of humour on top of this item in the news. And that's a great way of doing it. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Wow, Julie, there's so much more we could talk about. Um, I know. <laughs> it's such an amazing topic, isn't it? And It really is. Um, I just want to say well done again because – Whatever you're doing, it definitely resonated with me. And thank you. Um, particularly because of my views, my own personal views around it and the direction it's going. Yeah. And um, yeah, I hope this podcast will get you lots of business <laughs> as a consequence. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time. And before we, we end it, could you share with the listeners where they can find you and follow you on the different platforms? Yes, I am at Julia Bramble pretty much everywhere. So please come and find me Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. I've got two Instagram accounts. One is at Julia Bramble and the other one is called actually um, Celebrate Devon, which is lots of photos of Devon, funnily enough, which is where I live. So if you want to see those, do, um, do hook up over there. But yes, at Julia Bramble everywhere. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, I, had to, I did have one other question for you, which I'm going to ask. Um, for it. What's your view? Have you experimented yet with TikTok? No, I haven't. And I don't know that I will because at the moment I'm putting lots of energy into all my other social media sites. And I've still got a bit of a hangover. You know when it, it used to be musically. And so my daughter yes. was on it. My daughter who is now 16 was on it when it was musically. And then there was a lot of negative news about it because there was all sorts of content on there, which definitely wasn't suitable for teenagers. And mm. even though they had a teenage audience, they seemed to be very slow in getting rid of it. I mm. mean, there was a lot of really bad content on there. I don't want to say any more than that, no, but it was not no. good. So I still got that kind of sitting there in my mind plus I also know people who've been on TikTok say for the last three years for example so although people are saying now oh it's this great opportunity now actually I think it was a great opportunity three years ago right. I don't know if it's still such a great opportunity now especially because Gary Vaynerchuk is telling everybody to get on it it's just like oh there's going to ah, be this whole right. massive wave and all of a sudden it's going to be absolutely saturated but uh -huh. that's my own personal view i don't want to stop anyone from going out there and trying it out because for for brands that are b2c for example who are talking to the sort of demographic that's on there which is yes there are older people on there but it's still got a very young um feel to it you know if that aligns with your business then you know do it okay fab 
Fahab, that's that's great advice. And I had never heard of it until I'd heard of Musically, but I hadn't heard of TikTok until literally a couple of months ago. Right. And I went, okay, I'll sign up for an account, have a quick look at it, but I've never done anything else with it. So yeah. Um, and and I'm a bit like you. I don't think I will either. Yeah. Very 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 unlikely. And um, what about your website, Julie? Where can they find you on the on the web? My website is bramblebuzz.co.uk. I'm working on it at the minute. 